it's my great honor to introduce to read the introduction of uh, padma shri dr anil rajwanshi who has been very kind to us and uh, has accepted our invitation to come here and uh, be our guest of honor and uh, present this institute lecture so i'll read a very uh, brief bio sketch it, it's in no way uh, justifies the kind of accomplishments and the kind of contribution that he has made to our society so dr rajwanshi completed his btech and mtech in mechanical engineering from iit kanpur he then went on to complete his phd from university of florida he has received the jamna lal bajaj award in 2001 the federation of indian chamber of commerce and industry fiki award in 2002 and an energy globe award in the air category in 2004 In 2003 he received the global award for sustainability research. In 2014 he became the first Indian to receive the distinguished alumnus award of Florida. He was also the recipient of distinguished alumnus award 2022 from IIT Kanpur and was given one of the highest civilian award of Indian Padma Shri in 2022. He is currently the director and honorary secretary of Nimkar Agriculture Research Institute Nari in Fulton. he has been residing in fulton from the last 3 uh, decades and has pioneered the development of technologies spanning a whole spectrum of areas affecting the lives of rural population namely renewable energy based cooking and lighting power generation from agriculture residues water purification effluent treatment to the use of renewable energy with that i welcome uh, dr raju anshi thank you shubha good afternoon ladies and gentlemen first of all i would like to thank shobha telling her that i am a fossilized human being now all the work that i will tell you now was done by me in 70s and 80s since the last 25 years i have been more focused on understanding the mind of god and understanding our mind because i believe that that is the real future and the truth and so i would like to take your indulgence because what i will speak is 50 years old work so without much ado i'll start the title of my talk is you know in fact i would like to thank her and also you know i was very impressed that she and uh, sumit have set up one of the finest water technology center and i wish that it becomes one of the major center of india for doing water research and development now when she asked me to talk on water you know it brought back very good memories and i looked at things which uh, i did and i was very surprised to find that there are those things that i attacked at that time some of them are still unsolved and so with the bright students present here i would like you to again look at it you are much smarter than i am and i'm sure that you will do wonderful things by looking the whole issue of water not only its changes from this uh, you know from sea water to fresh water but how also it can be used in a much more sustainable manner as she said i run a small ngo called nimkar agriculture institute in fact i don't run it my wife runs it she is my boss in fact she is the reason why i came to fulton i come from lucknow so if uh, anything that i have done is because of her so you should give a clap to her this institute was started by a father in 1968 another padma shri in fact i believe that we are the only ngo in india which got two padma shris and uh, we we started the work in 1968 the whole idea was can we do research and development to help the farmers and all our work in fact what i'll show you is trying to solve the problems that i see in front of my nose and try to see what can we can do with the limited limited resources and another reason why i took her offer is because i love to talk to the youngsters because i want to you to come and help us and so this is a very selfish motive of trying to seduce some of the youngsters to come and do internship and help our institute okay um where is a uh, can i just do it here so just a certain perspective 
total projected water demand in India for 2025, this is the government of India uh, statistics, is around 810 billion cubic meters. Average rainfall over Indian landmass is 3,880 billion cubic meters. Our water requirements is only 20% of the total rainfall. However, rainfall is uneven and quite at times it does not fall where we need it. Hence, there is a need to develop innovative water management technologies. Anything that we do today is a water, is a water vapor management because uh, great solar energy has evaporated the water from the sea and rather than, you know, as I'll tell you, since I was very naive when I went to do my PhD, I focused on desalination, not knowing anything better. So focused on desalination, but later on I realized that, that is the wrong end of the spectrum. Sun has already evaporated the water. How to utilize that water where you need it is the greatest challenge. Rainwater harvesting, which is a part of water vapor management. I hope that from here, the water vapor management gets into the uh, vocabulary of the water people and so this is, should be the focus. Locally and its judicious use is the only solution to India's water crisis. Against this background, I will talk about our work and future possibilities. Our work on water technologies, my research journey started in US in 1975 when I went to do my PhD and we worked on seawater desalination, the use of dyes, the high voltage surfactants to modify air interface uh, systems. In fact, when you, I hope some of the PhDs who are here, when you look very deeply, then you start looking at a lot of things. And I was a maniac in that, and it was very enjoyable. So I took courses in surface physics, surface chemistry, took courses in uh, electromagnetic fields and waves, just to look at what is the surface and how we can modify. And then I, we also look at the use of sand, which is a very cheap solar collector for large scale desalination. And then the very pioneering work that we did in 1980s was a dew condensation. And in all these things, my basic focus was biomimicry. At the time, biomimicry was not the word. People never knew what biomimicry is or was. And, uh, but I understood right from beginning that the nature has all the answers. It has millions of years of evolution. It has optimized. And if we follow, which means we should understand how it is doing and then try to follow it, then it will be very sustainable and very efficient. And this should be the mantra of development of any technologies and any research project. I came back in 81 like an idiot, left everything. I was a professor in America, thought I was very, you know, I was very arrogant, thought I'll change India. India is a very ancient society. Nobody has changed it. It changed me. It made me simple, simplify my life. It made me focus more on spirituality. And it told me that the problems are so much that even in seven generations, we cannot solve it, especially the rural areas. And this is a challenge to all of you, rather than focusing on a very narrow thing in your own area. That is fine because it is also the development of the mind. But look around, see how you can, your research can help this country and especially the 60% of people who live in rural areas. So in Itnari, when I came, immediately the problems were surrounded. So we started looking at, you know, 1981, there was a very massive program by the government of Maharashtra on planting trees. They would give the seeds, people were the, the forest department, the forest department would plant, put the seeds, but nothing would come out because there was no water. So we developed a very unique technology. I'll show you how we took out the water from the soil by solar energy and fed it to the seedlings, and there was a hundred percent survival. Then we looked at, you know, where I live, it is a sugarcane growing area. So there was a distillery, and it used to pollute because the distillery effluent is very obnoxious, it is black in color, very foul smelling. And so the problem existed right now, right in front of me. What can be done to detoxify this distillery effluent. So we looked at very interesting solar energy technologies and we tried to solve it and I'll show you. And then 
we looked at the water purification for using solar energy. Today in the rural areas, the worst problem is the water that the children drink in rural schools. How many of you are aware of the rural schools? Have you drunk water there? You, and you you uh, survived that itself is a God's grace. The quality of water is horrible. And when we started looking at it, we said, what can be done? And so we thought that the best thing is to rainwater harvesting and then purification through the solar system that we have developed, which is, I think, very unique. And we are now putting in a rural school with 200 liters per day. And if it succeeds, then it will spread on large scale. So this is something which I would like some of you to help us. I have requested Shobha to help us in this matter, and we'll talk about it. Oops, oh, sorry, what am I doing? And then I'm, we are looking for good, dedicated engineers. Very little money, remember that. But tremendous challenges. And you will enjoy and you will remember your life because if it gets into your DNA, what happens in the rural areas, then you will be a great and a better human being and you can do wonderful for this country. So the first thing, I did when I was uh, doing my PhD was the use of dyes for increasing evaporation. Again, the idea came from the nature. Uh, we looked at how sea water gets heated up. And if you know a little bit, then the solar energy goes and absorbs in one meter and nothing else. And then this one meter which gets heated up, then it, it evaporates and produces the clouds and produces the rain. So we said, what can be done? To duplicate it and then we use the dyes. This is 1975-76 work and we used all different types of dyes and we found a 30 percent increase in evaporation took place and this was again the duplication of seawater by solar energy. Now when I was doing all this, I suddenly started thinking what happens to the interface? Water is a molecule, the sea, the water air interface is very interesting. If I can change the uh, you know, it's a, a surface tension, then I should be able to evaporate it. So we looked at surfactants to change the surface tension. And then I looked at the high voltage physics. I looked, I started playing around with 20 kilovolt, different frequencies with surfactants. And we did some very interesting work. And we found sometimes almost 300% increase, not every time it was duplicated, but something happened. And then my professor gave me a, uh, you know, an ultimatum. He said, I need a PhD, not a Nobel Prize. So you better finish your PhD. So I went back to my uh, total rudimentary, uh, clerical type of thing of putting different dyes. We did also very, uh, very interesting mathematical modeling. And we were able to, but that is something which you have to really look at. it Because the uh, water surface, is a very complex process. And even today, if you do the energy balance of the evaporation from the sea, the amount of energy that is following, by which you can calculate the amount of uh, water that will evaporate, is not the same. In fact, water evaporation is much more. And so we do not know whether the planktons are playing some major role at the surface where it is increasing. And this is something that needs to be looked at as a great challenge. So. I don't look at it now because my mind is somewhere else, but these are very challenging things for some of you. Then we, when we are doing this uh, desalination work, I said, what should be the cheapest way to desalinate on a very large scale? And I thought that the desert sand itself can be a great collector. So we did a lot of experiments of putting the pipe in the sand, then uh, heating it, and we found it was very efficient. And in fact, on a large scale, we developed a scheme which was published, and all these things were published in 1979, 80s, where we did a very interesting, uh, simple uh, cement pipe buried in the sand, and they were able to, in the flash evaporation, you could have very large desalination system. But there are very interesting future R&Ds. First of all, again, going back to biomimicry, there's a need to duplicate mangrove root technology. Mangroves are the best desalination system. They have a minus 42 atmosphere turgor pressure. 
So the water that comes through the root system simply removes all the salt and then the water comes into the plant. How many of you looked why, how the water travels in the plant? Why the water goes to 200 to 300 feet in a very tall trees? It's a very remarkable technology. There is no moving parts. The evaporation of the water from the surface of the leaf um, uh, is a pump. The water is in the molecular form. And so there's huge, fantastic things that go through the phylum and phylum of the trees. And if we can duplicate that, then that will be a fantastic thing for water pumping and also the reverse osmosis. Not only that, the root system of the mangroves, hello, the root system of the mangroves, it never gets clogged. We look at membranes and when we have these RO systems, after some time we have to change the membrane. But root system is a self-cleaning process and this is something which you have to look at very nicely. Second is, just like the mangroves, the seagrass. Sea grasses again are grown with only in the sea water. The surface area is quite large because of evaporation. And so I got the sea grass from Chilka Lake. We did some work. And I that is still again, you know, these things I, I left. But this is a great challenge. You can have the sea grass evaporating the water, the surface area increases, the water evaporation is much more. We saw that it was almost two and two times more than the regular uh, open surface. And then you can also produce biogas by fermenting the seagrass. So it can be a very nice and closed system for producing water and energy. And, uh, and then the understanding the seawater surface and the role of plankton and water uh, separation and understanding the cloud physics. So when I started looking at the evaporation of water, I found that the evaporating water is a charge system. And when you, it goes to, the, uh, to become the, the cloud, we still do not know how the top and the bottom uh, changes take place. Then the lightning. There was a very famous cloud physics professor in University of Florida I used to go and discuss. And he says, we don't still know what happens. But lightning helps in cloud seeding. And we still do not know, but it happens. So these are the things that are so challenging. It is worth for people to look at, and that is how the new development and great breakthroughs can come. And then implications for weather and environment. And not only that, it's a very interesting thing. You know, we talk about weather changes. We say so much rainfall suddenly has started coming here, so much dryness here, etc. The amount of solar energy on this planet Earth is constant because sun has not changed. The amount of clouds that come out of the sea are also same. What has changed is where they rain. And I think the reason, for one of the reasons is because of the changing magnetic fields of the earth, these are charged particles. It is possible that they are changing their pattern and it will be worthwhile for us to understand what a, why this is happening and then use it for our purposes. Then there was a dew collection. I read a paper in 1979 about this beetle, this is a dark beetle. This, a, this had just come out where it collected the dew at night and in the morning it would drink it and that's how it survived. So suddenly an idea came, you know, this, this is a fantastic way of really using the water dew for uh, drinking purposes. Looking in the literature, I found that there was no thermodynamic data. So we developed a complete thermodynamic data of dew condensation at different temperatures. So this experiment was done for six to seven months in Florida. And we developed the whole heat, mass tra heat transfer, mass transfer data. And this was published in 1980. This was, by the way, the first paper on dew condensation for large scale water um, uh, production. My staff in the University of Florida said that I should have patented it. I said it should be available free because after all, water is free. Nature has evaporated. So why should I patent it? And today is a very multi-billion dollar industry. People are putting these interesting systems where they condense the dew by you know, small scale refrigerators, etc. And so this is a very big industry. But I, I feel very happy that we were the first people to start this process way back in 1980. Based upon this, we developed this very interesting scheme. 
where you know at the bottom of the ocean the water is very cold 6 to 7 degrees celsius the dew is already there at the in the uh, coast so the idea was to pump that cold water from the sea pass it through these collectors and we developed all the heat and mass transfer data and collect the dew and then this would the water would go into the solar in the pond where a marine culture would be done and the uh, water same water which is warm now would be would go down and very interesting things we developed on what should be the pipe diameter what should be the pipe structure etc because by the time it comes in the top it should not heat up so this was very interesting and i think if you um, uh, go to the original paper you will read and you will find out all the things what are the future r and d there is a need to duplicate spanish moss aeroponic systems have you seen a spanish moss have you seen these small things uh, uh, on on the trees at least in in um, uh, florida there were a lot of spanish moss and they take all the material from the air water uh, uh, nutrients etc the tree simply acts like a structure where they because they don't have very good uh, root system so there is a need to understand how it happens and nature does a lot of very fascinating things keep your eyes and ears open you are next to the lake go into the lake go around the lake find out what is happening look at uh, the things and you will find a lot of very innovative things and do that rather than sitting in your small things or in fact don't even sit you, you play with the mobiles all the time in the uh, for the social media etc dew itself is a charged particle and if we have a charged collection surface area then the increase in dew efficiency it can increase now there are large number of places all over the world where they are collecting dew but they are not looking at the dew from this charge particle point of view and i think it is something which can be done by your students then we also looked at the floating dew collection plants on the sea because after all sea has already evaporated the water so you have the dew collection systems there you can collect the dew put it in a plastic uh, huge bag water is lighter in density as compared to sea water so it will float and then you can bring it and this can be a very good thing and our calculations showed that the whole coastal area of india can provide 50% of our drinking water demand for this country this is a very big calculation and it is but it is something worthwhile and you are in the coast area maybe set up a small experiment and see for yourself how things are water has water harvesting from clouds via kitchen via kite scheme this is a dream so when i was looking at all these things you know i came to fulton fulton is in the rain shadow area you know sahadri range is very close to fulton all the clouds that come they climb over the sahadri range they don't fall in fulton they go all the way to deccan plateau and then they fall so i thought maybe can i suck these clouds and an idea came that you can have a fantastic kite the kite string will be like a tube you suck the clouds and you condense it just like a dew so this is a dream and i'm sure some of the smart students people can do it this is far better than cloud seeding are you aware of cloud seeding so the father of cloud seeding i knew him he was uh, vincent shaffer he was in general electric and uh, he was a uh, uh, assistant to langmuir who was the first uh, industrial chemist who got a nobel prize so i started talking with in those times you could only send papers well letters and talk on the phone and he said that cloud seeding is very dicey it is never for sure because you can see the cloud where it will fall the rain nobody knows and this is exactly what is today hundreds and thousands of experiments have been done all over the world and it is a great scheme for the politicians because you spend money you send the plane you put in the particles where the rains nobody knows but the money has been spent but i think this cloud from the active harvesting of water from the clouds via the kite scheme may be something worthwhile 
Then this is a very interesting thing that we did. You know, as I said, there was a very large program by the government of Maharashtra for tree plantation. And the trees, the saplings, you know, don't have, the roots are, uh, just when they start, they don't have enough uh, energy to suck in the water because water is very deep, so they die. So we developed this very interesting thing in which we dug up a one meter by one meter pit, we covered with the solar still, and the water which is already in the soil, it is heated by the solar energy, it evaporates and condenses in the glass, and we collect in the bottle, and then we put the give this water to the seedlings and it was a hundred percent survival we did this experiment for many years and in fact we developed the whole basis again of the thermodynamic data of heat and mass transfer on how much water you can collect because you know people said if you collect it one year it will dry up but we did it for many years and the cycle is there because the rain water comes and etc so water bound in the soil can be uh, harvested by solar energy Pit size was so much, and two year continuous experiments done in the dry area of Fulton. An average production was around 300 milliliters per day per pit and 100% seedling survival. We did for many uh, things Lucina, Prosopis, so many different trees, and it was 100%. Trees did not grow very much, but they survived. In life, it's a survival which is the most important thing. The growth comes later on. We gave this technology to NDDPA, NDDB. Kurian came to know about it. So he invited me. He invited me and Nandini. So in 1990, we spent a couple of days with him and his team had come. And uh, they said that their biggest problem is, you know, they make a lot of salt, NDDB. They have a whole Kutch area. And they said, we don't have enough good drinking water. So they use this to put over the, the water table is very high, but it's all salty. They put this type of thing and they collected water. And so it was very useful. I do not know what happened later on. And this was published in Solonic Journal 1990, and some of you can read it. Then again, since uh, this uh, distillery is now very close to our house, which used to pollute the whole at night, it would be horrible to sleep with this pollution. So we said, what can be done? to detoxify this usually waste. And I was working in solar energy, so I said, let's look at it. We had already been correspondents, you know, this is 1990s, and people had just started looking at titanium dioxide as a photo catalyst. So we said, we'll do it. We did a lot of experiments in titanium dioxide and so many other things, and we did not find anything to do with titanium dioxide. 15 liters of effluent is generated per liter of ethanol produced. It's a very huge amount. It's absolutely black, foul smelling, very high in biological and chemical oxygen demand. So a 200 liters per day pilot plant was set up in our institute in 2000. And we found that magnesium oxide acted as a photocatalyst. People were very surprised. I was very surprised because you know by the time I had gotten enough knowledge about what the photocatalyst does, and I could not explain, though there were certain things that we could do it with the solid state physics, but magnesium oxide did wonderful things. Transmittance was changed from zero to 90% in two days. And 95% of catalyst recovery. So the, after the catalyst, we then uh, filtered it, heated it at a high temperature, and it would be recycled. And we did it for a couple of years, almost two years. The COD reduction was my 98%. And the treated effluent was successfully used on various potted plants. So cotton, uh, uh, you know, bindi, uh, etc. We used it and it was quite good. So this was the plant. Very simple. Stainless steel, uh, you had the, um, uh, with the photocatalyst, the display effluent naturally diluted. And uh, this is the so on the left side is a raw, on the right side is a, I can't read. So it's a solo treated, then uh, after two days, and then when you filter out the, um, uh, you know, the photocatalyst, it becomes quite clear, not completely clear, 
but quite clear. So, I called the digitally affluent people. They immediately did the calculation. They said it is no good for us. So, I said, why? He says it is too costly. In any way, they were putting the, the dirty water in the canal without uh, any problem because there was nobody to question them. Now, there are more stringent laws. But at a time, they were not, not interested. So, the two, three distillery people we discussed, and finally, it did not take up. I am sure now with more stringent laws, somebody can take it, the people can take it. Then, when we started looking at the uh, schools, we saw, saw the rainwater harvesting. Because you see what happens that if you take the water from the ground, there are so many salts, there are so many other things, and that is something which we cannot take care of in our system. So, we said we will look at the rainwater, and in fact, all our work is for water vapor management. So, if we have the rainwater and then we treat it to make it completely clean and drinkable, then what is wrong with that? Yes, there is a cost involved in the rainwater harvesting, the tanks and etcetera, but with this all this gel mission and etcetera, it can be taken care of. So, we developed this technology where the rain, you know, this, this is a small hut in our institute where the rainwater is uh, comes, then it is collected in the tank, then it is another tank. The rainwater has color because the tannins, the leaves, etc., which fall on the roof, they uh, take the color from that. So, we have developed a very simple low cost filter and that has been working for almost now two months and the color is completely transparent. We want to see how long it will be and it is very low cost and we can just remove and put it together. And from there, it goes to our solar purifier. So, this is a system. This is all the uh, purifiers, etc. This is today, it is almost, I think, one and a half months. Left is the water which comes from the tank, from, from the roof, and the right is from the filter. It is not clean yet and uh, removed a filter. And this is the purifier. Now, purifier works on a very simple principle. We did a lot of experiments, almost three, four, five years. We filter the dirty water through a sari cloth, eight layer sari cloth. Then later on, then we did all the experiments on what is the pore size and etc. So you remove as much as possible, and then this is the heat which kills all the E. coli. And we tested it in our microbiological lab. And we are asking Shobha to also help us in this. And we have been doing for the last three, four years, and we find that it is a complete E. coli finish. And the funny part was at 45 degrees Celsius for three hours, because the solar tubes they keep the heat they're very efficient. And at 45 degrees Celsius for three hours, everything is killed. The implications are amazing because on a completely cloudy day, even with a slight shower you get 45 degrees Celsius. So, the last three years, the data we have collected, we find five to six days maximum in a year, you get temperatures which are below 45. So, very simple technologies, but a lot of thinking, a lot of deep thought can have a tremendous implication. And these are not simply research for the research sake. This is for solving the real problem which exists around you which you can see all around, even in your, how do you get water here in uh, Mumbai? It's all treated. In the hostels, is all treated. Huh? BMC, so you trust BMC. Eh? I'll tell you a very interesting story about BMC. 19, can I have water, please? So this is, this is a very powerful treated water. Eh? And the interesting, in the interesting part is that this, this water is 87 paisa today. If I spend the money on the water tank and etc., 87 paisa per liter. And if we have this Jal Shakti mission, etc., then it will be almost free. So, and this is what, 10 rupees per liter or something like that. So, in 1986, I was invited by the commissioner of uh, Bombay Municipal Commissioner and his team because uh, at the time the prime minister was Rajiv Gandhi. And Rajiv Gandhi had sent a message 
that there are indications that uh, Pakistan will poison Bombay water, the lakes and etc. So we should have a desalination system. So he, I got a letter that you are an expert. So God knows from very new that I was an expert. I didn't know anything about. He says, can you please go, come and give us some advice? So I go there. So there are 15, 20 member team of uh, Bombay, all the engineers, chief engineer, etc. So I tell him in 86, 87, I think, that Bombay gets so, so much rainfall. Every society, every building should have a rainwater collection system. And we should then, uh, you know, modify it. We should purify it. And then we should also have dew condensation because all the air conditioners, so they all started laughing. They said, did we invite you from Fulton to talk about these riffraff and stupid things? This was the chief engineer. This suddenly it dawned upon me that they were looking for something else. Then I told them that there are floating desalination plants by this Swedish company and they immediately jumped because the whole caravan went to Sweden to look at the technology. So this is India. Nothing has changed. We don't look at the real solutions. We don't look at the good solutions because we don't use, want to use our brain. And when we don't want to use our brain, then we'll go for all these things. I was a chief guest uh, last month in HL Nasik, where they make Sukhoi and uh, all these uh, aircrafts. So they gave a very grand tour after my lecture. So I said, uh, why can't we make these things? Why can't we, why do we have, you know, Sukhoi at least they were making it. Rafael, they are not making anything. They are just simply importing it. Why? We are the people who talk about the third trillion, third the biggest economy, the biggest brain. You are the people who will go and run Google and uh, Microsoft. Why can't you do it here? Why can't we change the atmosphere here so that we can do wonderful things in, for this world? This is a challenge. So get out of your comfort zone. Look at the technologies, look at things, and uh, let's change the world. So we are putting a 200 liters per day unit in a rural school. And you can read all about this. This is a published in Current Science. Now, this is another very interesting uh, technology that we are proposing for talukas. Because we have worked, you know, in fact, we are the uh, people who developed the policy for taluka energy self-sufficient in 1990s. And the biomass-based systems came from our uh, work that we did in, in those times. And so I have always looked at Taluka. So what I feel is that in Taluka, if we have, if we make these small ponds, and I do not know what the size of pond is, and AI is so powerful now, it should be able to test, all, all, all you guys work all the time on AI, this is the challenge. Do the AI uh, 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 analysis, find out what should be the pond area, what should be the collection area, and how many ponds, and this will be like a, every pond is like a battery inverter system. When there is no electricity, you use the battery and inverter, same thing are these ponds. So when there is a, when there is a uh, rainfall, you will collect the water, if there is excess rainfall, you put it in the uh, canal or the river, or you take it from, from the canal or the river, and you can see that this can become a very major source of water collection and for helping the water problem. And the soil excavated can be used for in agriculture and in construction company, industry. So many bricks can be made, so, so many things can be done because it's a very good soil. And I feel that the issues of ownership and energy sources for water pumping needs to be looked at. And this is where you people come because you all the time love to stay on the computer and do it. Do it. It's a very remarkable thing. And if we take one project and find it where it works, then it can spread like wildfire all over the country. So in conclusions, water is the most precious source. We cannot survive more than three days without it. You can survive without eating. We can survive with so many things, but water and the future wars. In fact, it's very remarkable in 1979 when I wrote my thesis, PhD, I wrote in my introduction that the future world 
will have water wars, not energy wars. Though I was working in solar energy, because water is the most essential source. All of us know it, and so it is very precious. We should be working on developing it, recycling it, and not wasting it. Need to conserve it and recycle the waste water. First step towards sustainability. When you talk about sustainability, and all the time you people are talking about sustainability, water sustainability is the most important thing. I am very inspired by the example of Gandhi ji. My father went to jail with Gandhi ji in 1940s, and so that was also one of the reason. And Gandhi ji said that you have to practice what you preach. And I try to live. We all both try to live a very simple life. I have written it up very nicely. There are papers on that, on how I live, and I have done all the calculations. And in one fourth to one fifth of the energy that is consumed by an average American, I live a very simple and a very emotionally satisfying life. And I'm not. I don't live in a job of party. With all the modern technologies, I live. And we have also done the water analysis, and we. Normally use 180 liters per day per person. That's a very reasonable amount of water. So if you do this thing consciously, all of us can become sustainable. There is a, I think, a department of sustainability here. I don't know where, but at least in IIT Kanpur it is. And I tell them that the only way you can do sustainable is you make your department completely sustainable, your different uh, uh, hostels sustainable, electricity, water, etc. And everything will become sustainable. That is what Gandhi ji preached. If each one of us, a small unit, can become sustainable, the whole world will become sustainable. Most of the tap water in India is not fit for drinking. And this is one of the data that I have collected. If, you are, if I am wrong, you can blame that data, not me. Only three three percent of house, households drink piped water, which means without church, um, doing anything. Need innovative solutions to make it potable. More than 50% of rainwater goes to sea, also le leads to fantastic soil erosion. This is a very big problem in rural India. You know, you have this very flash floods, and all the soil is, is gone. And by those water ponds, we will not only save the water, but we'll also save the soil, and that is the most important thing. So these are the challenges that exist, not only uh, in other places, but mostly in rural India. And I would really request. Some of you to accept these challenges and see what you can do. Actively using water vapor management, which includes rainwater harvesting, dew condensation, and cloud management strategies for most of our users, is the way forward. History of civilization has centered around water resources. We all know, all the great societies, all the great civilizations came around great rivers. Nile River, Gangetic River, Yangtze River, all over the world, Amazon River, and it will same. It will continue happening the same way. We should not fetter it away. For India to become a great and powerful nation, efficient use of its water resources is necessary. Thank you very much. These are all the URLs. Uh, you can read about. Very innovative work that we did. In by the way, uh, I take great pride. I am the inventor of the electric rickshaw that you see all over the country. It was done in 1995, and uh, now people look at all these things. And at the time when we did, again the idea was to see have a. These are the type of things that we did. Problems try to solve them. Thank okay, you. Question. Thank you, uh, uh, Professor, for such a wonderful talk and uh, really eye opener for uh, quite a few of us. And few of uh, I see the professors are here who are already well aware of uh, this problem that uh, Professor was uh, pointing out. Uh, we have time to take a couple of questions, and after that, uh, we'll go for tea break. Okay. So. Yeah. Okay. Two hands. We we, we can we can have tea here. You can have continuous questions. Well, IIT yes. Bombay does not allow tea inside. <laughs> uh, hello, yeah. sir. Yeah. Uh, thank you for such an inspirational session and introduction to your works. My name is Nilesh. Uh, I did master's here in Center for Technology Alternatives for Rural Area. Worked with Bayev for one year and again joined back for PhD. Uh, two years back, 
uh, when I, uh, I belong to a joint family, my family decided to stop doing farming uh, due to many challenges that we all know. Then I, with my brother, stepped in and started doing three experiments. And my village is 18 kilometers away from Fulton City. So uh, I was really looking after to talk to you. I sure. actually tried to reach to ma'am on LinkedIn, but she's not quite active. On most it. welcome. Most so welcome. Uh, whenever we get time, we'll talk on range of the issues. But you should not talk. You should just come and join. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> and let me see what you can do. Okay. So I would and, like and, to... And you will see what you can do. Definitely. That's, that's all. But Thank you so and, much. And, and uh, things open up themselves. When you do things, a lot of new avenues are shown. Definitely, sir. I have done this in my life. Yeah. So I'm, I'm very impressed. There's a lot of people from Paltana. Huh? Mm, uh, very interesting talk, actually. I want to ask uh, regarding spent wash wala thing. Basically, you mentioned uh, uh, you can remove your about uh, distillery. Uh. So, uh, uh, you mentioned that magnesium oxide is a photocatalyst for 98% the COD reduction. I want to know, basically I work on the spent wash also. So I'm eager to ask some questions related to TDS or thing. Have you read, uh, means uh, related to TDS, can you? Uh, we did not look very much at TDS because our whole idea was BOD and COD. And so basically, uh, after that, you use that uh, water for, 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 for the um, uh, yeah for the, the plotted, plotted plants. Spent wash has uh, pretty because much he, it was TDS. not for drinking. So TDS, a small amount of TDS does not matter. And the and the best thing is if you are working here in uh, yeah. IDI Bombay, do it. Now we are the, into it actually. The, the great thing about science is replication, and I'll be the first one to to know if my thing was correct or not. If you replicate it, that is fine. So basically, I'm eager to ask that TDS whole thing. Apart from that, I don't have any. I don't know whether because I, I don't remember. Just 25 years ago, <laughs> and uh, you you can read the in the um, uh, you know the our okay because uh, this is quite interesting uh, topic because in India you know that everywhere distilleries are there and yeah. they are producing. So you can continue yeah. this discussion during the tea yeah. session. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah. Okay, after this, uh, we'll not take any question. We'll continue with the tea session and you can uh, discuss uh, over the tea. Oh, we just four o'clock. Good afternoon, yeah. sir. Yeah. Uh, sir, you mentioned about uh, dew as a charge particle. And uh, uh, I wanted to ask this question because uh, there is going to be a solar maximum for this year. So you have recorded data for so many years. Have you uh, uh, gone with this particular parameter? That whether it changes the amount of rainfall in certain region or uh, is there any? No, you are, you are asking that whether the solar activity changes yes. the dew, the the um, uh, the uh, charge. No, yes. that was not done. Okay. And uh, because the magnetic field of the earth is far more powerful than the because see the corona discharge from the sun with the because of the um, uh, Allen belt is taken care of. But we did not look at that. The only uh, I was want, uh, asking that uh, whether it will affect uh, the uh, collection. That uh, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Anything more? These are all smart kids. <laughs> I would like to see some sharp questions during a tea break. Is it a fair challenge? <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure they'll live up to the expectation. He said during the tea break. <laughs> okay, so uh, I think I'll not say if there are no questions. There are many, many questions that will be continued. Let's thank uh, Dr. Rajvanshi once again for such a illuminating talk.